Welcome to the Art of Appointment Setting Podcast, <laughs> where we ask today's most successful experts and entrepreneurs to share the most powerful lead generation and appointment setting tactics they use to build their business and grow their revenue. Now your host from the city that never sleeps, New York, is Kwesi Sachi Jinnah. All right, everyone, thanks for joining the conversation today. Uh, my name is Kwesi Sechijunai, and my guest today is Taya Roxon. Taya is a president of UYD Management. He is a three-time TEDx speaker and the host of the highly ranked podcast, As Told by Nomads. The podcast caters to the next generation of leaders and is heard in over 150 different countries. In addition to that, his podcast was recently ranked as number two business podcast by the world, uh, by Entrepreneur and CIO Magazine. And Tayo has spent over 20 years living and working in four different continents. And so he's considered an authority in communicating effectively across different cultures. He's spoken at TEDx, the World Bank, United Nations, and so many other places. I'm really excited to have him. His work has been seen um, in Forbes magazine, Huffington Post, Entrepreneur, and different other publications. So Tayo, welcome. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, my, <laughs> my, uh, my Ghanaian brother. How are you? <laughs> So you know when we when we connected, uh, I remember when we connected. It was an, at, at an event that you were speaking at, and uh, ever since we've stayed in touch. But one of the things that I feel that you know makes me connect with you even more is your persistence, right? So you told me of a story where you got rejected so many times, yeah, right. um, getting into TEDx, and you still tried over again. Was it ten times? Oh, uh, TEDx is eighteen times. Um, 18 times. So why do you want to get into TEDx so bad? Well, first of all, even before the TEDx, I have to take you back. I, and like, I've experienced rejection so many times, right? I'm, I'm Nigerian, obviously. Um, and we, we won the Jollof Rice War a long time ago. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad about that. But, I'm not uh, going to go there, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, when I, when I first, I spent the first nine years of my life in a military dictatorship. You know, when you sort of, that was just sort of my... My initial. That was in Nigeria, right? Yes, yes, yeah. And then once I turned, uh, you know, nine, ten, my dad's job as diplomat began to take us all over the world because we had transitioned into a civilian government. But you know, you, you, you when you grow up, I initially grew up in chaos, and I didn't quite know what the world was, so I didn't necessarily know who I was. I was uh, trying to figure out what it was that I that I, I was good at, and. I remember when I graduated from college and I was trying to trace all this back because I only knew that my background as someone that's traveled in, and lived in five countries and four continents by the time I was 18 was something that made me a minority everywhere I want, wherever, everywhere I went. And so that gave mm -hmm. me an identity crisis initially. And along the way, I figured out how to turn that identity crisis into um, a connector, into a skill. And so when I graduated, I was thinking, okay, I have this skill as someone that can connect across cultures. I've always been deeply affected by injustice and inequality. I mean, I initially grew up in injustice, and then it's just something I became hyper aware of. Just because you know, when you're when you sort of grow up in a dictatorship and you travel all over the world, you're very aware of that. And I didn't quite know how to turn that into a career. I thought, you know, United Nations. I thought. Mm, any international organization, I thought maybe even being a diplomat like my dad. And so I kept applying. I applied to many places. Um, me not being a citizen here, obviously, it was uh, that's New York City for you with the motorcycle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> me not being a citizen here also made uh, a little bit of an interesting complication. So what ended up happening was I applied to over 85 jobs, right, by the time I got graduated in 2011. And all of them said no. They all said no. All of them. Um, all of them. They like you're not. You don't sponsor. You're too young. The what the problem you want to solve? We don't feel like you have the experience for it. And so I took, um, you know, in a moment of desperation, I took the first job. They gave me an offer. I was basically I basically went down to every place that gave me an internship before and said, "Hey man, yo, yo, I need to. Can we? Uh, <laughs> do you got something? <laughs> do you have something?" Um, and so yeah, so that that was actually my first real experience with rejection. To to to, to take it back. Right. 
Yeah. And then, you know, I, I did that for a year and a half. And then August 22, 2012, I was driving to work. And then at the same place of work that I, I never imagined for myself. And I, um, you know, I, I got into my Burgundy Camry and Toyota Camry. Mm-hmm. And I, I got to the part of the road where, you know, the, the, it merged into the highway, stepped in the accelerator pedal, got on my, my side of the lane. And then I was cruising, you know, 60 miles per hour when the neighboring car loses control. And all of a sudden, my car, uh, my lane is cut into half. And so I'm swerving out of the way so I don't get hit. And so I, I smash into the left guardrail. Boom, and then I hit one car. Boom, two cars. Boom, back to the right guardrail. Boom, left guardrail. Boom. And then a car this time is about to flip over, over this bridge. I'm 22 Your years car? old. Your car? Yeah, my car. Over to, I'm 22 years old, and the only thought that came to my mind at that, at that moment was, have you done everything you said you were going to do? I mean, here I was, 22 years old. Uh, ever since I was 10, I sort of knew that I wanted to do something to make an impact in the world. I wanted to mm-hmm. ensure that people didn't feel the way I felt. And I wanted to make sure people never felt um, like they weren't seen, heard, or understood. But here I was, 22 years old. I didn't have anything to show for my life. And that thought freaked me out. You know, my everything was happening really quickly. But my adrenaline kicked in, slammed the brakes, and then somehow um, I was able to get out of that car and skate. I was never supposed to survive that. I mean, my car oh, was totaled. Amazing. I was 22. My car was totaled. Two, it, uh, the two cars hit. If you were standing there, you would have seen a car zoom. Pshoom! But I was there unharmed. And that was my wake-up call, Quasi. I moved shortly after that to New York City. And so when you ask me why, where with this tenacity, this uh, persistence, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's part of it is for my background, but that wake up call I had really allowed me to let go of fear, right? So I, 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 I stopped fearing fear that day. And what I started to fear was not achieving my potential. And I, I really right. became intimate with this, your life, anybody's life could go like that in an instant. And what do we? What would you have to show for yourself? So that—that's why. Um, that's a long answer right. to your question, but I wanted to. I feel like I needed to take you back to sort of understand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, yeah. It's really fascinating, and I think what you said is so good. And the reason I ask is also because of the follow-up I have. I mean, not every business owner or entrepreneur, or you know, any of the listeners might not have that dramatic experience or wake-up call like you did. Yeah. Um. So, and you've been talking to a lot of people. How would you encourage them to consider talking to people or speaking as part of their marketing strategies? Yeah, well, um, and I certainly hope no one has to go through that. But <laughs> I think I think at every point, someone has a you have a turning point. You have a moment where you decide whether you're going to be authentically yourself or you're going to let the world define you. And it's at that moment when you're making that choice that really sort of sets the course of your life. So. When a lot, a lot of times I feel like everyone has a story to share, no matter who you are. You might not feel like you're a good speaker, but you could be a podcaster, you could be a YouTuber, you could be a writer, but whatever you're doing, you have to make sure you're passionate about it. And so in order for you, whether you don't have a life changing experience, in order for you to truly be in a transformational speaker or someone that's doing something that he or she loves, I always, I, I, I have a, um, a five step process. So the first one is find your drive. It's called fable. I love mm-hmm. ac- acronyms. Fable. Uh, Fable is like a story. You know, I was sitting in for a story, but that's what I gotcha. think. So Fable is find your drive and passion. So F is finding your drive of passion and unmasking yourself. A is attaching your expertise to a world problem and then systemizing your lessons learned. B is building the foundation of community and influence so that you can turn your followers into movement machines. L is leveraging your story into opportunities. And E is expanding your circle of influence to make a meaningful impact. And so let's, let's unpack on the A for a second. How do you attach the expertise? You can't do that without a, without F. I mean, I, you got to start with the F. So first of all, right. <laughs> people think they know who they are, but they don't actually um, a lot of times. So in, you have to find out what makes you tick because if you have to, if you want to be able to, you have to be able to reconnect with your past and connect the dots backwards so that you can know where you're going. And in this step, I usually have people become their own biographers, like write down, you know, up until this point, what are the mm-hmm. significant, what, what has happened to your life? What is the significant moment of what at each, at each age of your life, if you can go back, what happened? What were the turning points? What, what were the, the moments where you experienced loss, gain, 
what happened. And mm -hmm. the reason why this is important is because you start to be, you start to see some patterns, right? And you might not have seen, and you're unmasking yourself here. I'm not, you're not filtering anything good, bad, whatever you're writing there. And this gives you clarity and allows you to defeat what I call the supposed syndrome, the idea that you're supposed to be something else. It also allows you to deal with those inner conflicts. So once you, you first of all, you do um, that, that part of becoming your bi biographer, the other thing that you need to do is um, you start to ask others how they see you, right? You need to understand, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, ask others how they see you. Like, well, this is based on what you've known about me. So your colleagues, your friends, your family, all that, you know, you could ask them a series of questions. What are, you, what are your first impressions of me? What kind of careers do you think I would do? What do you think my passions are? And then you, right. you, put, you pair that, you ask others, you pair what you did with yourself, uh, and, then, uh, you, yeah, and then you find the, 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 the connecting threads. And then mm -hmm. the third thing in this stage is you then do the multiple levels of why. So these are moments when you're asking yourself, why, why, why? So you've done your biography. You've asked people all these questions. Now you got to ask yourself, wh why do you want what you want? What is it that you want? And then you start off with the question, what is it that you want? And then you ask, why? Wh why do you want to change the world title? Why then I'll say, oh, because I want to, I feel like helping people connect across cultures is great. Why do you, why do you feel like helping people connect across cultures is great? Well, because for me, when I was younger, I was always a minority everywhere went and I saw how that made people feel unseen. Why do you feel like it's important people are seen? Well, I feel like if it's because people are seen, people are able to own their own stories. Why do you feel like people should own their stories? Well, if, if people own their own stories, people are able to mm -hmm. be the best version of themselves. So you go down until you can go from, to like seven levels. So you can right. do anywhere between three or seven levels. And then... Then you can then figure out how to attach your problem to your expertise or world problem. And I love this. I love yeah. this. So, so why is so important? But you know, the people, there are probably a lot of business people or entrepreneurs listening. You know, they have small businesses. They've been running it for two, three, or I don't know, five years, and they look at themselves and they're like, "I don't have any interest in story." And this this leads me to a question I have for you. Do you focus on a personal story or do you lead with a personal story or you live, you lead with a business story if you're looking for a unique message? Yeah. I mean, I think I usually start off with a personal story because for me, a lot of times on the surface, someone would say a oh, kid, five countries, four continents. Um, okay. He's a minority everywhere he goes. What's the significance? And I looked around and I was like, well, what, what is the problem right now that I feel like I can solve? I was like, mm -hmm. too many people in the world are not, um, listening to each other. We live in this world where it's digital platforms, globalization, but people still don't understand each other. You have to figure out how to understand people and understand each other. What if you could turn those lessons, right? This is why the A part you're asking, the attaching, the, turn those things into lessons and then create a framework. Just like I create this fable thing. Mm -hmm. That's what I started to do. I was like, in every stage, what you, in, when I'm dealing with HR diversity, you come across people that look differently from who you are. How do you make sure you don't operate from your bias, right? Right. So how do you make sure you don't use that to inform your hiring, uh, firing, and and you know promoting? For me, that first start for me was like, how do I make sure I make friends when I move to a new country? How do I make sure people don't dismiss people? How do I make sure I'm not dismissing people? And so that's how you start to see it. So I start to see, okay, this is my personal experience. I've already done the, the hardest thing and figured out every single uh, reason, you know, as to my existence. Now, how can I make that something that's part of a problem? You could be great at sports, but the thing is, I mean, maybe you didn't make it in the league in, in sports, but what you can see with sports is sports is a place where people from different backgrounds come together. So how can you use that skill of, of being that team captain and apply that to life? You could be someone like, that's a great team builder. Right. You have to start to think of it that way. Uh, for me, someone that was able to move and navigate, I was like, I can do diverse inclusion. I can show people how to find their self-worth. And that's how I came up with use the difference to make a difference where it was two twofold. It was one way to get someone to understand their self-worth and understand how they are meaningful here. Right. They can make an impact. That was my car accident. And then the other thing is that, yes, we live in a world of differences. Now, how you can celebrate that diversity and not be intimidated by that. So I, that's why that the levels of why mm -hmm. is so important, because then you you don't just do the surface level stuff. I want to be the best selling author. You get to the reason why you want to do that. Right. And then you when you get to the reason why, that's how you get to all the problems that you could solve.
So, so you take a personal story, you delve a lot deeper into all the cadences of why you find the real reason you tie it into whatever relevant problem you can solve as far as business or society is concerned. And then you present yourself. This is so good. This is so good. And and I have a follow-up question for you on that. Yes. So I want you to give us some practical, you know, steps and tips on what process do you use? You know, what's the process you went through when you were applying uh, for speaking gig? And what process did you use for processing rejection? And what did you do differently the next time? Yeah, yeah. So once I, um, you know, once I came to New York City, my rejection stuff didn't, my rejection story didn't stop, right? But the difference here is I actually felt more confident uh, being who I was, right? So I came to New York City to, um, to do to do school because I, you know you, it's a different thing when you have a near death experience and you tell your parents like hey I'm moving to New York City they're like what, what, what are you doing <laughs> did we send you oh, to America to the just- accent now <laughs> yeah. so, you, so you, you're just going to go to New York and do what make sure you're going to school okay so I was like all right fine I'm gonna get my my MBA so you, you got your parents you got there so what happened was I'll get my MBA go to school at night and then I'll come back. Um, you know, during the day and it's like, I figured out how to tell my story. And I was like, well, how do I tell my story? Because I think I, I was giving the world too much um, agency over who I was. I was like, I'll just start a podcast. And so like what you're doing right now, I was like, I'm going to figure out this, how to solve this problem that I'm trying to solve. People, we live in global, global, global world and digital world, but people are not connecting globally and digitally. So why don't I just bring people that grew up the way I did and ask them the question? Right. <laughs> So anything that you want to solve, like you're trying to figure out with speaking, you just bring people to ask about that. And so what happens is that you end up educating yourself. One, you end up positioning yourself as a thought leader because you're, you're being you know, in position with so many people that are already in that industry. And it's the best education you can have. You have that there, though. Now it's time for you to figure out to leverage that into opportunities. So graduation came. I knew that I wasn't going to do um, the job, any job I didn't want to do anymore, especially after the near-death experience. But I also had, you know, I'm not a citizen. I'm here on a visa, and I'm like, man, this is crazy. Um, and so I, I made the unpopular decision not to go to any of those recruiting trips. And so I was still trying to figure out how to make a popular podcast be monetized. Right. And I just took a, you know, I was just like, oh, I'll just take a consulting, you know, whatever. I have an MBA. I'll take a consulting job that will allow me to sort of work um, you know, work through this and work, you know, after at night. So took the first one, uh, within a few months, this lady calls me into the office. She says, Hey, can I talk to you? Um, and then she goes, um, we're going to have to let you go. What? Like, okay. Yeah. Like, it was at that. It was like in the movies, man. I was like, I stopped hearing everything there. And I imagined a scenario where I was flipping the table and saying, you so good. Then I was like, Nope, Nope. Don't do that. Keep it calm. And, and she's like, <laughs> <laughs> she's she says don't make a scene just take your uh just oh walk out God. the door basically i walked to the lab to my place they already signed me out and I, I didn't have email access i was like okay gosh this is uh pretty embarrassing so <laughs> i walked up i curled into the uh, a ball when i got home and i was i just cried that day i was like man this is crazy i don't have any money and then i was like i'm just gonna launch my website on this and i launched a website where i just turned the podcast into a website as well and then um I, I would continue. I was like, I don't have any choice. I'm going to continue to do this. And then after that, I, my, one of my mentors says, Hey, we've been seeing what you did. You've done with your podcast, man. We really, I just, I, I'm the president of this new startup. I want you to come replicate that success. So I was like, okay, cool. Great. This can, maybe I can even f- form my personal brand into the company. Um, yeah, that didn't happen. Right. right. So it was hard. It, yeah. Because you can't necessarily, if there's already a company with a vision and a lot of people, you know, it's, it's hard for you to just now make that, you know, absolutely <laughs> the company. So it, it, it was, it was interesting. We tried that for a year and a half and then, you know, um, he's still my friend today. Uh, but he had to, he just said, Hey, look, we, we, I see that you're still focusing on the, the stuff that you love um, more. This isn't working. We're going to have to let you go. So I was fired two times in the span of three years. And then I was like, fine, I got fig- I've got to monetize this at this point. And as like, I, I, this is all I want to do. And I'm spending way too much time on this. And I looked deep down. I said, organizations, HR, diversity, inclusion. Right. There's a lot. This is around the time of the, the shootings, the it was Brexit and all these things. I was like, 
there are all these problems here. I'm, I'm going to be the guy right. that's going to be one helping people. So I start, I, I went on LinkedIn. I, I, I created a list of people that I wanted to do. So I was like TEDx. I created, I saw a list of TEDx people, TEDx um, events near me. I, lo- I looked three to six months out. I found all the people speaking, created crafted pitches. Um, um, all the HR and uh, all the companies in, in my area, I looked about the HR and the marketing and the decision makers, chief diversity officers, created a whole list of them. And then I went to work. I created a pitch. Initially it was, hey, this is who I am. Um, this is my, I, I have a podcast that's done pretty well um, and my expertise on such and such and such. Do you accept outside speakers? Did that for like, I don't know how many people, lots of people, well over a hundred people mm. uh, for, you know, for TEDx was over 18 before I got a response. Um, and then for the companies it was well, well more. And then eventually I got one company to say, yeah, we'll love you to do that. Uh, can you come talk about this? We, we really don't know how to deal with this facilitating difficult conversations. Did really well with that. Got a testimonial, asked for a referral. Bam, uh, the system is set in place. And initially, there were some of some of these were were you know in between with the podcast. I had gotten like one off speaking engagements before, like I'd done the World Bank, I'd done United Nations Foundations, right. but I couldn't really. But you know, with World Bank, United Nations Foundations, it's the prestige right. rather than the. But you were able to leverage right. that, right? Yeah. Then yeah. See, I started to then connect the dots. Why? This is why I always tell people to always look backwards. So I say, well. In my pitch, what can I use that's of value? I have a podcast. I have, I have my personal experience, mm-hmm. right? It relates to the problem I'm trying to solve. And I've spoken at World Bank. Bam. So that was, World Bank was my first thing. And then I eventually um, got one organization to take a chance. I mean, they said yes. The TEDx story was very interesting, though, because throughout the process of New York, I've been applying to TEDx. It's like, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I, you know, because everybody's Ted, 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 right. Ted. Um, and I went did that before I was 30. That was just like, that was just my goal. I'm not 30 yet. I was like, I got to figure a way out. And um, so I kept applying and they all, they will say no or they will be Why no response. Why do they say no? Um, sometimes they don't give you a reason. <laughs> like, I, we, you know, we regret to inform you that uh, we have great candidates. You were one of them, but not yeah, this Yeah, it's year. like a canned response. A I was always a canned response. And then... During that moment when I got fired a second time, I changed my approach. I did the same thing. I was like, this is who I am. This is the topic. I'm looking at the theme. We relate. And I, reply, I applied to maybe, I think, 10 at a time. I think I applied to eight prior to that. I applied to 10. And then I kept following up, following up. How many times? One thing happened. I, I followed up like two to three times. But the third time I followed up with one of them, one of them said, hey, um, hey, you're in. Thank you for um, <laughs> thank you for graduating. I was like, what? 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 It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, we, we took a look at it. Then I was like, so if I didn't follow up, I wouldn't have known. It's like, oh, we were just, you know, we're just. This is our first event. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, thank you. But I was, I didn't even argue. Great. And then I was, I was like, great. I don't have to worry about anything. Two days later, one of the people I'd also followed, we said, hey, we love your topic. We would love you to speak. And I was like, shoot, I knew he said yes to the first one. (laughs) (laughs) So I was like, hey, so I just got another one. Can I just, you know, switch it? (laughs) Can I talk about this? And then they said, yeah. So that was the story of the two TEDx talks. It is about persistence, honesty. And if I didn't follow up those times, both of them, I sort of have been lost in their emails. Right. <laughs> so it's like, oh yeah, thanks for following up. One of them needed one of them needed speaking for the new new TEDx. The other was already an established machine. They were just, uh, I guess, they get a lot of applications, and I, I, my persistence is what they noticed. And so that's the story of TEDx. And so once you start to get two in this in that span, and I already got that company client, you can see how the momentum started to to build. I, I started to feel more confident. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was now connecting. I was like, World Bank, TEDx, co- corporate client, bam, bam, bam. And I was like, oh, fascinating. I can it. And that's, that's the story. That's how it happened. But on the road there, near death, fired twice, broke multiple times, <laughs> um, didn't uh, live in New York City, didn't do it, didn't go to any, spent all the money to go to MBA and didn't use my MBA for anything. Like there were all these things, all these lessons you learn along the way. But I then took everything I learned and said, this is what I need to do. So I love this story, man. It's always fun having a conversation with you. Where can people learn more about your work and, you know, what you're currently up to, the new project and so on? Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And so my, um, a lot of my uh, work is on tyroxen.com. That's my digital home. You can find out things I'm doing with, uh, you know, a podcast, my coaching, 
um, or my writing. Um, it's right there. I'm at Ty Roxon everywhere on social media. I think I'm the only Ty Roxon in the world. So I, that's that's unique in that sense. And um, you can catch me at the Black Panther <laughs> premiere at 10 p.m. today in Harlem. <laughs> awesome, Ty. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Art of Appointment Setting podcast with Kwesi Sachi Jinai. Find out more about how to get high-value appointments at Catalyze.io. And while you're there, check out the free resources for appointment setting. And be listening for the next episode of the Art of Appointment Setting podcast.